It's so great to see you this weekend. I want to encourage you to grab your notes out and follow along with us. You can kind of track there. Or if you like uh, digital, you can go online to YouVersion and follow along with us as we teach this weekend. Well, I want to start by saying happy Father's Day. And I know the reality is when we say those words, there's a variety of emotions that are attached because as that video said, even right now today, 25 million individuals around the United States do not have fathers in the home. And that doesn't even include those who maybe dad was there, but he wasn't real present or active in their lives. So no matter what your age is, you may be experiencing those emotions on this day. And you're saying, Jason, that's kind of a depressing way to start off this teaching. Well, let me encourage you. I'm actually not depressed by it because I believe in this room right here, right now, those watching online as part of this community that we already have the answer to that problem. And that's why I'm excited. We've got incredible men who are bold and faithful, who are loving and selfless, who are investing not only in their own children to make a difference, but they're investing in the lives of some of those 25 million that do not have that fatherly influence. And as a result, we are making a difference. I believe because I've seen what God is up to in the lives of people in this church family, in this community, and I am believing for greater days ahead because we do have the answer and it's found in our heavenly father in the love that we're given through Jesus Christ. I know in my own life that has been incredibly true. There's a picture right behind me of my family here that they're gonna go up. And that's my son Titus who's 13, my daughter Talia who's nine, my daughter Maya who is six, and my beautiful wife of almost 18 years, Heather. And we have this legacy and story because I had individuals that poured into my life, one specific man that I'm gonna share with you today who invested heavily in me to help me become the man of God. God has called me to be so that I can then love and pour into my kids and invest in the lives of other people. This idea, this concept of investment is absolutely huge. See, growing up, uh, I didn't grow up in a home where my father was a Christ follower, was not a bad man, uh, but he just did not have the guidance to give me in some areas when it came to uh, morality and kind of growing in my faith connection with Jesus. And so as I went along, I was kind of disconnected. Him and I, I butted heads a lot. Half of it was my fault as well. And I was kind of stubborn. I was a typical teenager. I was getting caught up in wrong relationships and bad situations, putting myself in compromising uh, things. And as a result, was really lucky a couple of times that I didn't, didn't end up in juvie or worse because of some of the poor decisions that I made. And what was interesting is along that way, as I kind of gave into peer pressure and was making bad choices, I didn't realize how desperately I needed a good moral compass and center, somebody who could show me what it meant to follow Jesus. And at the age of 16, uh, my mom kind of confronted me and said, hey, uh, she could tell there were some decisions I was making that weren't good. Said, hey, you need to go to this Bible camp. And I was like, I'm not going to Bible camp. She's like, well, you could start paying rent then. I'm like, Bible camp sounds awesome. And, and so I went to the Bible camp. And the last day I was there, I had a vision of Christ, had an encounter with Jesus, he began to reveal himself to me and forever changed the course and trajectory of my life. And I felt called to be a pastor, but I was scared to death because I'm like, God, I don't even go to church. It's gonna be hard to be a pastor when I barely go to church. I don't know exactly what you want me to do with this. And God was in the process of putting together a plan to really guide and direct my life. I will also say on a side note, my dad now is a believer in Christ. Him and I have a great relationship, love and respect him. Uh, and he encourages me on a regular basis. But in that season, God was doing a work uh, in me where I needed something very specific. And I'll say this, there's a tension in our culture. This is not an uncommon problem. The issue of the need of spiritual fathers. We also need spiritual mothers, but we're in desperate need of spiritual fathers to invest and mentor us. And I'll be honest with you, it doesn't matter what age you are. I don't care if you're in your 20s, your teens, you're, you're, you're about to retire, you're middle aged. Here's the truth. All of us need people that are pouring into us and investing in us so we can grow spiritually. And we also need to be investing in the lives of others as we have been invested in to. We live in a society that's so focused on connection, but we got about a million relationships. We're about a mile wide and an inch deep a lot of times. And God is calling us to get these deep invested relationships that will help us to grow in our relationship with God so we can really become all that God has called us to be. And that is such an important part of our journey and what God is leading each of us into that we need to be aware of it. Now you may say, Jason, I never had the privilege of having someone invest in my life like you're talking about. You know, maybe you had a disconnected father, maybe a father 
father who wasn't around. It was a hurtful situation, abusive. Maybe it was just complete abandonment. And I wanna encourage you, we serve a perfect heavenly father who knows exactly what you need, who loves you, who can provide you with everything you'll ever be in need of. And as you cry out to him and ask for that type of mentorship, no matter what stage in life you are, I believe as you open your eyes, he will provide that for you. So I encourage you with that. And if you're here this week and saying, Jason, I don't even know if I believe this God thing. I don't even know if this is for me. I wanna encourage you as you kind of kick the tires a little bit and try to figure out this faith thing, that the principles we're gonna talk about this morning when it comes to investment are things that Jesus lived out. He did in the lives of other individuals. And as a result, their lives were forever changed. So I believe as you hang out long enough, as you walk in these principles, even if you don't believe yet, that there'll come a point where you'll begin to see that God is real and that he has a purpose and a plan for you. And we love you being a part of our family here. Because I believe so much in what the Bible says, I wanna encourage you today. I believe it talks a lot about investment and there's some critical verses we can read that will encourage us in God's plan of investment this Father's Day. So would you turn with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse 14 through 17. It's 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse 14 through 17. And as you turn, that's about two thirds of the way in the Bible. I wanna share a little bit about fatherhood. Uh, the Bible is a mixed bag when it comes to dads in the Bible. Uh, you got guys like Job in the Old Testament who was a really loving, faithful father. He prayed for his kids, invested in them. You got a guy like Joseph who was like the stepdad to Jesus, our Messiah. He poured into him. He taught him compassion, how to love people. He was a godly man who died probably early on in Jesus' life. Then you've got people like Abraham who was so excited to have kids, he kind of tried to take it into his own hands and caused a lot of confusion in his house and even had to kick one of his sons out. Then you got a guy like David who was a king who, I mean, it was a hot mess in his house. There's people trying to kill each other, take people authority, kick him out of the kingdom. Yet what I wanna communicate is that in all of them, God worked. And in all of them, God moved. So if don't ever feel like, hey, I'm too far gone or I made too many mistakes, God can and will work through you. Just give him the opportunity, be honest about it, and take steps to move forward in what God has for you. The guy we're gonna read about today who wrote these verses is the Apostle Paul. Paul actually was not a biological dad to anyone, but he was a spiritual dad to a number of significant men and women in the Bible. He invested in people like John Mark and Timothy and Titus, Priscilla and Aquila, and he made a huge impact on writing close to half of the New Testament that we read today, one of the most influential figures in the scriptures. He was also the one who founded the church in Corinth where we're gonna be reading this verse out of today. Paul knew they needed spiritual guidance. He's the one who had been investing heavily in them. He had just got done rebuking them and now he's trying to encourage them to really live the faith. And he says these powerful words. So if you read with me, 1 Corinthians chapter four, verse 14 through 17. He says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel or the good news, and I urge you then to be imitators of me. Basically, follow my example. That is why I sent you Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, to remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach them everywhere in every church. So what does it mean to be a father and not just a guide? It means investment, deep investment. And the challenge we have today is will you and I choose to be invested? Will we choose to invest our life and the life of others? I know for me at the age of 16, when I was in deep need of a spiritual mentor and guide, God brought an individual into my life who's been a major factor for a number of years now. And I actually have the privilege of introducing him to you today because he is here to teach with me. And his name is James Maurice Boyd. Would you give a big welcome to my pastor and mentor in my life? Thank you, sir. Well, first off, let me thank Jason, Pastor John, and the staff for allowing me to come this way. And it's deeply an honor for me to be here and for me to share the pulpit for Jason in a different way. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do here. So thank you, sir. You got it. Thank you, for, thank you for flying all the way from Florida to be here. So. Yeah. Well, as we kind of start, I'd love to hear you share a little bit uh, about how we kind of got connected and how that process began. So 22 years ago, I'm pastoring a church in the inner city, Portland, and my wife knew um, Jason's mom, and Jason had just gotten saved. <clears throat> so Jason's mom was looking for someone to mentor him and knew that I was pastoring and that I had a heart for God. And so 
Um, Jason's mom asked my wife, Charlene, do you think that your husband would be willing to take Jason on um, and mentor him? And I'm, I'm, of course, my wife said, well, I'm sure he will be because I know my wife. And so my wife came and said, well, you know, I have, Sharon Bishop has a son. He just got saved, and um, they're looking for someone to mentor him. Babe, would you, would you mentor Jason? And without hesitation for me, to me, it's an opportunity that God gave me. And I said, absolutely so. So in our church, is not diverse like this. We had a, a bunch of pepper, and then this grain of salt comes walking through the door. <laughs> hey! And, and so the assumption is... This guy must be Jason because he's not necessarily reflecting everything else. That sunny face was there. Y'all hear what I'm saying? So I said, okay, that works for me. And so from that day on, you know, I, I, Jason tells me that. And I remember telling Jason, you know, at the end of the service, man, God has got a call in your life and you're going to be a pastor. And, um, and, and I'm supposed to mentor you. And I don't know that Jason understood it all the way. In fact, he said he hasn't, didn't understand it all the way. But I know how God works, and God works in ways that we don't necessarily always That's have right. our hand on. And so that was the way that I seen things worked out. Yeah, and it was kind of crazy because he knew that I was coming, but he didn't know at the time that God spoke specifically to me about being a pastor. And so at the end of the service, he says, you know, I feel like God's called you to be a pastor, and I'm supposed to mentor you. And I'm going to myself, man, how did he know that? My mom, did you tell him that part? She's like, no, I didn't tell him that part. And it was God orchestrating uh, this process of mentorship, and it... it created this journey of over 22 years now of uh, doing life together. I remember the first week that I drove to inner city Portland, about 20 minute drive from where I lived in Vancouver, Washington. And I went to his office and I said, okay, I'm ready for my first time to mentor. And he's, he hands me a broom and I'm like, okay, well, you, you got a janitor here that can do this? Or he said, he said no, you're going you're gonna to sweep and clean uh, for about an hour and then we'll get together and we'll do mentoring. And I'm going, it's a new mentoring program I'm not aware of. And uh, <clears throat> And he just spoke to me and said, hey, until you're willing to uh, invest and serve, you're not, you, you never can lead. And he taught me a lot of lessons that really transformed who I am as a leader. And I remember going uh, to his house for soul food, which I still love to this day. Mm. Uh, some good cooking. Uh, good cook. I remember uh, two-hour prayer meetings every Saturday. Mm -hmm. I'd come down and learn to pray and spend time with him when I wasn't uh, playing away soccer games uh, at that time. I remember going, to, uh, he helped me teach a Sunday school about six months after becoming a believer. I thought, man, you are crazy. You don't know what you're doing. I, I think I spoke it uh, two times, lasted about 10 minutes, and the youth pastor had to bail me out. Um, but uh, I remember our first convoy of hope that we did down there in Portland, uh, first person I ever led to Christ. He was a part of that. I remember sharing my faith on the streets uh, with uh, the local people, with gangbangers, drug dealers, the whole bit. We would go all throughout the community and uh, minister. And uh, I just remember traveling with him uh, when he would speak, and I'd watch him prepare and pray, and he'd take me with him. I'm kind of watching how he taught and how he interacted with people. And uh, I remember uh, moments where he'd rebuke me because I was getting off track, getting distracted with things, and he'd say, hey, you know, you're better than that. This is what God's called you to, and he wasn't afraid uh, to point those things out. I remember when he helped mentor Heather and I. Uh, we started dating when we were 16. And uh, we got married when we were 20, and I remember him doing the premarital counseling and investing in us. There's actually a picture of us uh, uh, on our wedding day, I think he threw up there, where he uh, performed the ceremony and was a part of that. And never going to forget that. Yes, I did have hair. Um, <laughs> Next picture, this is James and his wife, uh, Charlene, and them just uh, investing in us and loving on us. And uh, he's always been there. I remember when, uh, just recently, even this last year, because I call him on a regular basis, uh, I was flying down uh, to go to Cuba with a missions team from our church, and I was gonna be doing a layover in Miami, and he said, hey man, let me know. And he got went out of his way, changed his work schedule to drive over so we could have 45 minutes together just to catch up, and this is us. Uh, you see the creepy guy in the background, I don't know what he's doing, but... Uh, <laughs> But we just had a great time connecting. It's been a lifelong friendship that really has uh, meant the world to me. And Thank it's you. been uh, transformational. It's led to a lot of other mentorship in other ways uh, with other people as well that have encouraged me to, to give back. So it's huge. Thank you, son. You got it. So let me ask you a question. Why did you choose to invest in me? You, you know, Jason, the reason why I really chose to invest in you is because your mom gave me an honor to take her son on and to pour into her son as much as I could. But also the Bible says, go into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So biblically, my responsibility was to invest 
everything that I had and everything that everyone gave to me along the way. And to me, you were valuable because who knew that God would have you in this church and who knew what God was going to have you do for the rest of your life. And so it was extremely an honor, number one. It was important to me. It was a biblical concept. And, and it was something that was essential that I would do. I was honored to do so. And I'm still honored to stand here with you or sit here with you. And I've always been honored to, Jason, have me fly at different places to speak at different times. And it's always been an honor to serve this man because this man served me. I know that our whole theme is, will you choose to be invested? And because of your investment in me, it allowed me to make an investment in others. And uh, we'll be forever grateful for that. That's part of the, the depth of our relationship. And as Paul shares this verse of scripture, um, he says these words, uh, for though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ Jesus through the gospel, the good news. I urge you, be imitators of me. What do you think Paul is trying to communicate to this church that's relevant for us today when it comes to investing in our life? So in my mind, Jason, it tells me there, though there are thousands of guides or myriads of guides, tutors, um, there are no tutors is there while you need them for that period of time, but they're, they're not there for the long haul. And for me, I'm here until I'm no longer here um, to help you. 24 hours a day, I know that you're not going to call me only when you need me, but I'm here for the long haul. And what Paul is saying is follow me as I follow Christ, and I'm following the example of Christ and what he did with the 12 disciples and beyond. He was there accessible to them and was there to, to give them anything that, and everything that they needed that he could give. And I think we forget Jesus changed the world with basically 12 disciple rejects. Like nobody else wanted these guys. Mm -hmm. And he invested in them and poured into them. And that's really the heart of a father. Uh, with your own kids, pouring and investing in them, with the lives. And we gotta do more than just our own kids. We gotta invest in others too because there's 25 million kids just in the U.S. alone that need that investment. Uh, but that's a huge part of it. And I wanna start by asking you, and I know the answer to this, we've been doing this a lot this weekend, but what do you believe are some keys to investing in somebody's life? What are some critical things that we need to be aware of if we're going to be investing our life into the life of another person? So one of the keys, I think, is to love people, to love people. But loving God, but loving people so reciprocal. If I love God, God loves me, then I love you. Two, to be willing to listen to the needs that people have. Oftentimes, our wives will say, talk to us, but we're watching the TV, and while they're talking to us, they're saying, babies, can you hear what I'm saying? The guy saying, yeah, just... What he's saying is, yeah, I hear you, but I'm really not listening, so stop talking to me so I can watch TV. <laughs> the reality is I have to be able to hear what you have to say in order for me to respond in a way that helps you to get to where you want to be. And I think the other thing that is important for us to do is to understand that God has a requirement on us to invest our lives in the people so that they can be all that God wants them to be. And, and, and in doing so, then we are able to help them to become better um, and understand the importance of being investors in invest in investing in people's lives because it's all about us investing. For me, I'm a gift with gifts to give, and so people are expecting to get something from me, and so I better give my very best for them Amen. and, and that's, to them. That's a big part of it is that you were willing to give your best and to, to pour out. You're willing to be an example. Uh, we've talked about some, uh, we had in your notes, you'll see there some, some keys to being a mentor, to being a parent, to being an investor uh, in your own kids and in the life of others. And the first step we have on there is pray for God to show you with whom to invest your life. Now, obviously, if you have kids, you don't need to pray about that. You just need to invest in them. They're your children. Uh, but beyond that, we should be praying, God, who do you want me to pour my life into? Additionally, that can be an encouragement that doesn't have that. And you did that with me. And the second part of that is really key. Number two is when he speaks, follow through. And you were great about that because you would follow through in your investment. You never made promises you couldn't keep, but you also weren't afraid to apologize for things that you couldn't uh, take care of. And I think that's a, a big part of that is that this process is that when God speaks to you, follow through, because you can't pretend to show up. You were there for me. I could call you, uh, you know, any time of night. Uh, you need to be an emergency if it was too late, but uh, making sure that, that you were accessible is huge. And, I, and that's another thing, Jason, is extremely important that you're accessible. 24 hours a day, but I know that anybody that I'm investing with, when they're calling me, that means that they need me, and therefore I need to be available for them. 
I'm here not with my wife and my children because my son here We were trying not to do this. We made, we made three services without crying, man. <laughs> but Jason needed me to hear for you guys to see that it's not about color. It's about the kingdom. It's, it's, not, about, it's not about age. But it's really about the person that God brings to your life because he brings gifts to me because he is a gift from God to me, and he's helped me more than he understands. He has helped me, and, and it's continually helping me. And Sorry, he, and no, and you don't apologize at all. I've been doing it pretty soon, I'm sure, too. <laughs> I think part of the thing to remember is that the accessibility is huge because he opened his life up to me. Uh, that's intimidating. Uh, he let me come to his home and eat food, spend time with his sons, who I've got a great relationship with to this day. Uh, spend time hanging out around his, his sons and his daughter, get to know his wife. Uh, I did stuff with him. I, we did life. Uh, and so he opened himself up, which is not easy to do. But the reality is you can't have the reward without some of the risk. And he was willing to do that. Just like I opened my life up to my kids and I pray and I encourage them. But now I have tons of people that I am pouring into because he gave me that opportunity. Being accessible is a big part of it. Uh, the fourth one that I want to mention is being an example. Uh, even when you mess up, I got to say, in my in my experience up until this point, I had never seen a man who could honestly admit that he had made a mistake and be an example in the good and the bad. And I remember moments where he would say something he did, he, that he shouldn't have or he would you know, be frustrated about something and act in a way he didn't, he didn't want, think was appropriate. And he would come back to me and say, Jason, I just wanna apologize because that wasn't God's standard for, for my life. And I want you to know that, that he has better than that. And I hope you'll forgive me. And I had never seen that. It, it humbled me. And I remember in those moments, I thought, man, you know what? I don't have to be a perfect man. I just need to be a man pointed in the right direction, doing my best to love God when I mess up, admit that I've messed up, tell my kids I've messed up, whoever I'm working with, and then I can move forward. And I have that example of humility. And to this day, it almost brings tears in my eyes because that example has stuck with me, that to be a man is not to be perfect. To be a man is not to be strong and tough and, oh, I never make a mistake. To be a man is to be honest and genuine, to be integrous and to follow the example of my Savior. And so I, I uh, commend you for not just your good, positive, godly, praying, seeking God example, but also for your willingness to be humble because uh, it really spoke to me in a big way. Thank you. And I, and I learned that as a result of uh, fathering my children and pastoring in church because I realized a lot of times men, in the case of my father, would apologize after he would do something that didn't make sense to me. And I realized that the most important thing that I could do was exemplify a father's heart, and that is when I mess up, not to allow pride to lock the door, but to allow pride to be the key that opens the door. And to put pride aside and let that door, the love that I have for my children and family and mentees open that door and say, hey, listen, I messed up. And it's important that we understand that, men. It's important that we understand that we have to be transparent and let our families know that I messed up there. Son, I shouldn't have I never said that to you. Will you forgive me? Because that's what your child needs. What they don't need is a he-man like like Hollywood wants to make it, and you don't have to apologize. No, you have to apologize. That's why Hollywood has so many relationships. So we have to learn how to do it God's way. And the beautiful thing was you, but by you doing that, <laughs> go ahead. By you doing that, it allowed me to apologize to my father for my behavior and to help reconcile our relationship and restore. It was a, a beautiful example of truth. Uh, the next one on there in your notes is point them to Jesus. Um, you did such a great job of doing that because one of the things we've talked about, and I'll let you mention into it, is just that sometimes as a mentor, you're not gonna have the answer. But you always said, Jason, scripture, scripture, scripture. Don't just, whatever feels good, or just let your heart lead you and guide you, the kind of these Disney mottos that don't, they're not truth. Uh, we need to let the word of God, the truth of scripture, who God says we are guide us, and then God changes our heart so we can trust that. And you were so key on go to the word of God, talk to God, connect with God, and teaching me that, uh, it forever changed me. Thank you. And that, again, the word of God says heaven and earth will pass away, but not one jot or tittle from God's word. And so we have to stand upon God's word and say, this is the standard, not the world, but this is the standard. So if we stay with the standard, we can't go wrong, even though we as humans are not perfect. We stay with the standard of God's word and stay on our knees before God in prayer. We do an outstanding job. We're still human, but we'll do an outstanding job. 
And what was beautiful was you knew that there'd be times when I couldn't get a hold of you, but I could get a hold of my heavenly father. Amen. And I could have that relationship and I could cry out to him and he would answer. And you were just a, a, an echo of what he was already saying. Amen. And, it, and it taught me how to go to him. And the last one that we put on there, which is huge, is encourage them to their God call and value in Christ. And James did a wonderful job of just reminding me of what I was actually capable of, because I was scared to death. When God said, be a pastor, I'm thinking, you got the wrong phone number. Um, and I didn't like talking in front of people. And he, you know, I had dyslexia, which is a difficult thing for me to overcome with some of the writing and, and putting, pulling things together. And you spoke into me, and you reminded me of who I was in Jesus, which is just incredible. Encouragement is incredible. So as a mentor, we become a prophet, priest, king, a provider, a protector, and my job, Jason, was to make sure that I was encouraging you. Because, gentlemen, can I be honest with you? We get enough discouragement. Amen. We get enough frustrations on the job and in the communities and the home sometimes. We're, we're overwhelmed with it. What we don't need is someone tearing us down. But what we do need is someone building us up on our most holy faith. What we do need is somebody saying, okay, so you messed up there. Keep it moving, man. I apologize. Get it right. Keep moving. And I think... Encouragement is what we all need, not just the men, but ladies. We all need that encouragement from each other. And instead of saying, well, well, you, you know, you keep messing up. No, listen, how many times do I mess up? Just keep building me up because we're going in the same direction. Amen. And, and I would challenge you, if you're looking for a place to invest outside of just obviously your kids that God's given you, if you have children, <laughs> Uh, look for other opportunities. We've got students in this church where a variety of them do not have a father influence in their life in our youth ministry, in our children's ministry here. It could be in the community through a sports program. I coach a, a soccer team and I'm always invested in these young men and encouraging them and challenging them uh, and, who, and who God's really called them to be. It could be in your neighborhood. It could be through a, um, a brother and sister program, big, bro big brothers, big sisters. It could be through Compassion International. Uh, pray and ask God and I believe that he'll open up those doors in a variety of ways for you and I to really be able to experience that. But the question is, will you and I choose to be invested? Uh, the second thing that's important is practical steps to finding a mentor. I have people ask all the time, okay, well, I get about how to be a mentor a little bit, but how do I find a mentor? What does that look like? Uh, I've got a variety of mentors in my life. James was the first that really poured his life into me. I've got people like Pastor John, our lead pastor, who I've been with for 14 years, who's been an incredible influence in my life. People like Jeffrey Portman, uh, Phil Rasmussen uh, when I was at school, Steve Hunt on our executive team here, who encourages me in my faith and my journey with Jesus. And uh, the first step was praying for God to show you who to let invest in your life. Because here's the truth. Uh, most of the time, we don't know. And so as we pray, God begins to reveal us to different people. We, we run into somebody, we talk to someone, and all of a sudden it kind of clicks. And to follow up with that, when God speaks to you, follow through. The odds of them coming to you like James did in my first situation and saying, hey, I feel like I'm supposed to mentor you are very slim. So go find that person, seek Amen. them out. And if they turn you down, it's okay. God has somebody else for you. Go and talk to that person. Don't give up just because it's difficult in that moment. The next thing I'd really encourage you with is be teachable and humble. Uh, in our relationship, if I wouldn't have been teachable and humble because I didn't know what to do, I didn't know how to be a pastor, none of that stuff. I didn't know how to be a Christ follower. Uh, if I wouldn't have been teachable and humble, he couldn't have done anything with me. And I was really convicted by that because sometimes he'd say stuff that I didn't want to hear, but I needed to hear it. And so be willing to be humble, teachable, and open to what your mentor is going to invest in you as they challenge you in your faith. Next, be hungry and don't take their time for granted. If you're going through a book, if they're taking you through a process, come prepared, come ready, because you don't wanna waste their time. You wanna take full advantage. Come with questions. Be looking for how you can grow uh, in your relationship. And then fifth, don't be afraid to reach out when you're hurting. We talked about it as men, especially sometimes when we're hurting, we're like, man, I gotta get it all together and get fixed before I go have a conversation. That's like saying I need to be completely healthy before I go see the doctor. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make sense. At all. Go see them and let them pour into you. It's okay to be vulnerable uh, when you're hurting and allow them to feed back. And the last thing is this, and we're gonna kind of spend our last moments on this part. Give back and become a mentor. Mm -hmm. uh, Arielle, who works in the church here in our small groups department, who's working on her credential to be a pastor, she, uh, I've been investing in her life for a long time since she was in middle school. And she said to me this week, Jason, the fact you've invested in me allows me to invest. She was just teaching the last service down to our middle school and high school students and pouring into them. And it's, she said, it's all about a cycle. We get invested in so we can invest. We get Amen. invested in so we can invest. If we don't have that outflow, 
we get, we get backed up and we're not really gonna be who God's called us to be. And so I really encourage you, invest your life. I've got a variety of men and it all started with you. We can blame you that you, you poured into me. Amen. And now I've got these people like the Richies and the Ariels and the Kevins and the Rogers and the Asundas and, and Brielles that I have been able to pour my life into my wife and I because you took a chance on somebody at the age of 16. Amen. It made all the difference. And that's so important, guys. Can I be honest with you? To be fat is faithful, available, and teachable. And some of the things that I realize is that God brings people to our lives for us to pour in. Um, I, I, because of time, I can't go into a lot of things, but I asked God one day to allow me to witness to somebody. I went to the bus stop. The guy is, had been drinking all night long, sitting up and looking at me. And I'm thinking, why is he looking at the side of my head? And what, why, why, why are you doing this? And then I realized, but I asked God, and God sent a person for me to bring him into the kingdom. His name was Sterling. A guy named Michelangelo Bell. A couple of people say, you're going to be mentoring him. I said, there's no way in the world. Not me. Not, I'm not the one. And yet God gave me a word from him. And from that time on, I've been mentoring him for seven years. And he's become a preacher. He's become a, a oh, he's trying to go on the school board. Um, has his own 501c3. So... Being faithful to God, being faithful to the people God bring into your life, your children. Be faithful. My daughter just got saved again. She had backslid and was away from God. And she called me up last week, Friday, and said, Dad's crying. And I said, I said, what's going on, baby? She said, I finally figured it out. I was at the bar with somebody, and we're having beer, uh, wine together. And the person says something, and click, ma'am. And, I, and Dad, I'm giving my life to the Lord and, and told my wife that I got a ministry to do. And it's not going to be, quote, unquote, what everybody's accustomed to seeing. But God is giving me a ministry. We have to be faithful, available to our children, available to our mentees. And then we have to be teachable. What does that mean? It means that Jason is teaching me as I'm teaching him. He's teaching me life lessons that he's learned. And as a mentee, as a mentor, I become open to learn what he's teaching. And so it's critical that we understand that as parents, our children are going to teach us, and it's okay for us to, for them to teach us because full cycle is when we're 70 or 80 and can't move the way we want, they're still going to be there to help us work it through if we've been investing in their lives. Man. And that's what this is all about. You'll see some notes that you can study this week about the life of Paul and how he invested in people. You'll see at the bottom of those notes some percentages. And, and here's what we're trying to communicate. Will you and I choose to be invested fully? Not just partially, not our neighbor next to us. Will we choose to be invested in the life of another and then allow others to invest in us? Because here's what it's all about, guys. It's about legacy. James and I have been talking about this the whole time since he's been here with us and spending time in my home. We've been talking and hanging out with my kids. It's about legacy. When we die, the only thing we take with us is our relationship with the Lord and the people we influence for him. That's it. Everything else burns away. The car is gone, the house is gone, the crazy job, the crazy hours, it's gone. The only thing we take is our personal relationship with the Lord and those we've impacted. So the challenge that we wanna leave you with this morning is simply this on Father's Day. Could you imagine what would happen if? Come on. Come on. Could you imagine what would happen if all of us chose to find someone to invest our life in? How would that change our neighborhoods? Come on. How would that change our workplace with a person that you work with that's miserable, they're hurting? How would that change the situation that you face in your own home at times? How would that change the country in which we live, the county in which we live, the state in which we live, the world in which we live? If every person in this room today, those that have been a part of the services and gatherings this weekend, online or in person, if we chose to invest our life in the life of another, and we allowed people the opportunity to invest in our own life. I don't care how old you are, we all need it. It's the gospel. It's how Jesus changed the world by investing in a small group of individuals. So will we take the opportunity? So there's two questions on your notes that I want you to look at. First question is simple. Who will you let mentor you? Will you ask God to bring you a person who's an example, somebody you can look up to that can pour into your life? And then the second question feeds into that, it's the cycle. Will you invest your life in someone as a mentor? There's somebody that you already are gonna be revealed to in the next few weeks as you pray, 
that you're gonna invest in their life and someday they're gonna be reaching people and making a difference for God that you never even could have imagined. Amen. But will we take the opportunity? I thank God for this man. I thank God for this relationship, this Father's Day, because it changed the trajectory and the course of my life. And so I wanna have the privileged opportunity of having him pray today for all of you who are fathers or mentors, investors with your life. Would you stand right now if you're a father or someone who's investing in life with someone else? We wanna be able to pray for you and just ask for God's blessing on you today. Go ahead and pray, Pastor. Thank you. Father, today we stand together united. And as a force, Father, we can invest in the lives of the people that you bring to our lives. Yes, we are gifts, giving gifts, gifts to give, like the three wise men coming to bring a gift to the greatest gift. Father, today we ask that you would bless the men that are standing, cause passion to fill their hearts and their minds about becoming a better father, Yes, Lord. an investor in the kingdom of God by investing their lives and their time and their resources and their energy their ear, Father, to individuals in need. Father, like Jason and I, Father, we are a force brought together by you, an unusual and ununique situation, but you brought us together to touch the kingdom for such a time as this. And so today I pray for the men, I pray for the men, the young boys, the women in this place who will also be investors in the lives of women. God, I pray that you would cause a passion to burn so bright that individuals would bring people into the kingdom. They would see this as eternity. I'm investing in eternity. Like a man would invest his money for when he retires, God, help us to understand that we're investing for our retirement in heaven. But we want those also around us to be there with us. And so today we pray for Pastor John, who also is an investor. He's been invested in Jason and hundreds of other peoples over the last 30 years or so. We ask that you would bless them to become even greater investors, this staff. God, let them invest even greater and bring more people that would catch the vision. Father, I ask these things in Jesus' precious name, and we give you the glory and the honor. Amen. Amen. Amen.